John, we talked about 18 months ago. It was at the height of COVID. Uh, we've since obviously emerged from COVID. Uh, we've all enjoyed a pretty strong 2022 in terms of pent-up demand. How has it been for you? And, and 2022 has been surprisingly good. And the mix of business has been different from the last two years, obviously. Americans are back on the ground. Um, and what we would call real American business, coming to Ireland on a touring holiday um, and just enjoying themselves. Um, domestic market has been good and um, not as good as the last two years, but that's fully understandable. We all yeah. want a bit of sun and want to escape. Um, but generally speaking, um, 222 compared to the last full year we've had, we'd be over 40% ahead of 2019. So we can't complain. That's fantastic. And those American visitors are very valuable, aren't they? Because they're the ones that, you know, spend money, stay longer, tour the regions, you know, that they're the real cash cow for Irish tourism. Yeah. And um, I'm in the business maybe as long, if not longer than you. Um, and uh, we, we regularly hear this term about emerging markets. And yeah. um, no market has emerged in my yeah. lifetime in tourism. Um, the way America performs just just yeah. doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, and certainly the Park Hotel in Ken Kenmare in general, we have domestic markets with American business and the rest is all single digit percent business, yeah. a European business. It does, it's, it's not it's sim as America at all. Yeah. American business is just it's a different market. It's a different wealth base and they view vacation differently. They holiday more often and towards retirement and they just gravitate towards Ireland. Yeah, and it's it's great, and, and also our lingus, you know, have restored so much of that transatlantic air capacity, um, and I think they're programming the same again, if not more, for next year. So fingers yeah. crossed that market holds up, whatever about other challenges. Just in yeah. terms of, of of you know, you mentioned turnover being well up, which is obviously fantastic, and I think that's been reflected across the broader tourism and hospitality industry uh, this summer. But costs have also escalated. Is that putting yeah. is, is that putting a lot of pressure on, on on the bottom line or you know there's only so much of that cost that can be passed on to the consumer isn't that true correct there, there is a price for every product that the consumer is willing to pay and um, that willingness um, for accommodation this year has been higher um, than recent years which has helped us a lot but costs are something that every business in every corner of the world has to deal with and they go up and down they fluctuate all the time so you have to manage that there's good there's there, there's costs which we're making savings on we, we actually have put in a whole new um air to water system that's going to save us a fortune on oil and there's a number of things we have done internally and you need to look at your menus you need to look at the, the cuts of uh, cuts of meat that you're serving you need to look at the con composition of your dishes all of those things which you may not have been as sharp on in the past come into focus an awful lot more when costs are, are, are when you're under pressure from costs and labor costs as well so you, you you just you cut your cloth to suit your measure that's the world we're in there's no point crying about it we have we're, we're all been dealt the same cards and you play them the best way you can and you manage your own business and you get on with it yeah and of course cost and price is different from value um, and i think what's critical is that irish tourism as a whole still represents good value for whether it's the domestic market or the american tourist uh, as you yeah. say do you have any thoughts on that? Because there's been a lot of sort of negative stories over the summer about, yeah. you know, hotels charging excessive prices and car hire firms and so on. Yes, any thoughts yeah. in particular from your own perspective and maybe just on the broader industry perspective? Yeah, the, the value we bring to it, I think, is very much to the way our people and the way we serve and the ambience that we create. A cup of coffee here is the same as a cup of coffee or anywhere else in the world. OK, it's what we do with it and how we serve it and how we how we approach the customer is different here. I was away recently with our, with our daughter who works overseas and she is on. A, well, I can't tell the whole country how much she's on, but she's not on a huge wage. She's above a minimum wage there, but the minimum wage in the country she's in is 660. Okay. A cup of coffee is one fifty in the coffee yeah. shop, but the minimum wage is only six sixty. Yeah, now we're we're heading for over eleven euros, eleven fifty there or thereabouts. I think in in in, in the coming weeks, that has an impact on cost and on 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 the price that you pay for a product. And I have no issue with that. We live in a first world country, and I think we often forget about that. If you live in a first world country, we have to pay first world wages, and that's absolutely fine. I have no difficulty paying good wages to good people. Yeah. That has a that has a knock-on effect. You cannot have everyone on good money and have every, everything cheap. It just doesn't equate. So we are a first world country. We do provide a very good service. Yes, it is dearer than overseas, but we don't um 
have a, have a, a cost of living as low as low as those places overseas. Yeah. So the price has to be more, and that's just reality. There's just yeah. no two ways about it. But I yeah. think I think when people come from overseas, um, and they go home, the vast majority would say that was a lovely holiday. That was a great holiday. Yeah. And, but we, we absolutely one hundred percent have to be conscious of cost all the time. And when you look at hotels, yes, you can say, oh, I stayed in such and such a place a tourist resort overseas sun and um, and it was half the price of the irish property here it probably was but actually when you when you bore into that i guarantee you they're selling you synthetic orange juice for breakfast yeah they're not giving you the local bacon they're not giving you the local sausages so there's there's a difference to the approach that we bring not personally that we as a country bring to a tourism product that will be streets ahead of those products overseas and it's yeah. very easy to sit at a pool all day with the sun baking down yeah. and you have two sangrias and you have a slice of melon for lunch and it's all great. You can't yeah. do that. That's not this destination. Yeah. So yeah. in the location we're in and what we offer, I think, I, I believe, and I know from our guests, I'm not talking to a single-minded, um, we offer a very good experience for the price the guests pay. And I think if you look at the international scale of like-for-like like properties, um, I think the quality of what's offered here for the price given is decent it's not cheap yeah but we're not a cheap country we can't yeah. expect to yeah. be cheap because it's yeah. not a cheap country and that's just the way it is and and i think uh, a lot of that is supported by the surveys that Fulcher ireland do uh, when they talk to tourists as they're leaving the country yeah. the, the, the value is there and, and crucially expectations are either exceeded or certainly met which is very encouraging we, we got to keep that going um, yeah, and just, it's, just, it's, just, it's a small little challenge. It's just a small little challenge in that that following um 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 I was going to say Brexit, following COVID, um, the skills in the industry were under pressure as an industry. Yeah, um, you cannot deliver that experience unless you have skilled people in place. So, yeah. um, I I I think we all have a responsibility to train and. Um, um, new people coming into the industry to the best of our ability and make the working environment as comfortable and as attractive for that person coming in as possible because we, we will need every single person we get in the next 15 years. Absolutely. And, and we've talked about it before, but, but tourism and hospitality is the great employer in Ireland. Um, I mean, one in 10 jobs nationally and indeed in Kenmare and, and Killarney, um, I'm, I'm sure it's much higher than that. Yeah. It's funny. I often say to people, you can leave Kenmare and drive the Ring of Bear, which is 85 miles, 115 kilometers there, 20 kilometers there, thereabouts, and you won't see one factory. Yeah. You can drive Killarney, the Ring of Kerry, and apart from uh, one or two in Killorglan and Killarney, um, you will see no mass employment outside of tourism. Yeah. So it is a huge driver of local um, livelihoods. Um, and I, I, I would safely say the whole West Coast is similar to that right up. Connemara, yeah. bloody Foreland, all the way up County Clare would be very similar. So tourism and, and the value we offer in the product is crucial. So yeah. we need to be conscious of that. We have to be constantly looking at overseas what, where we are in the marketplace. But so far, given the pressures that have been under the industry for the last number of years, I still think we're performing fairly well on the international stage. Yeah. Um, just going back to the costs of business and inflation and so on, and, and there's a lot of focus at the moment on energy inflation. Have you seen that in your own business, the sort of the spike in energy inflation? And, and uh, what can we do about it? There's no panacea either for a business or for a government, but it is a concern, isn't it, that you know the energy inflation is going to continue soaring month after month after month? Yeah. Um, and... We have a gentleman who stays with us who would be extremely high in the international energy business based in the Middle East. And he said, we're only halfway to where, we, where they expect costs to go. And so we are going to see this continue. And uh, we haven't probably experienced inflation the way we're having seeing it at the moment since the 80s. So there's a whole generation of managers and there's a whole generation of operatives out there who haven't experienced this pressure before. And this is going to, this isn't, a blip and um, we haven't had serious inflation in food costs in um, in energy in labor costs to any to the level that we're experiencing and all of that now all of those inputs result in a higher price product at the end of the day there's there's, there's no way of squaring it we, we can turn off all the lights we want we can reduce 
and um, the temperature of the water going through the pipes we can do 101 things internally we're only tittering around the edges um, yeah. about it. and the bottom line is costs are going to go up you have to manage your business in the best way possible to get through it and you're dealt the the deck of the hand of cards that you have and you just have to get on with it but it's not unique to here yeah those costs are going up everywhere else as well and i had a meeting last week with relay and shadow in england and the one thing they kept talking about was food cost food cost food cost food cost yeah so while the the, the, the breast of chicken may have cost us 110 um three years ago it's up near three euros now so that's yeah. a phenomenal increase. It's like a burger in a, in a restaurant. If you go into a restaurant and you're having a burger, you expect to pay somewhere in the region of 14 to 18 euros for the burger. Yeah. You probably need 25 euros for that now or there yeah. thereabouts. That's probably not achievable in the consumer's mind. Yeah. So you need to look at other things. You need to look at other things that don't cost as much to put together that offer wonderful value, wonderful flavor, wonderful taste, but you're controlling your cost all the time internally. Yeah. And yeah. like butter, for instance, butter now, which no one in a, going into a restaurant ever thinks butter costs money. Like yeah. they'll have a bowl of soup and say, sorry, you can have more bread and butter. They don't even think it costs money, right? Yeah. But that box of butter costs us 33 euros more this year than it did last year. Yeah. Now, you can't give butter anymore as a result. You need yeah. to be careful on how you serve it and you just give a smaller portion and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we've become much more focused on things like that. And it's things like that that you have to think around with on the edges, cut here, cut there, but not at the impact to the guest. Always give the guest the value that makes them come back. And that's crucial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the whole energy inflation, I suppose, comes from the war in Ukraine in particular. Um, and, and the war in Ukraine has thrown up another issue for Irish tourism, and that's the the... Um, humanitarian um, influx of, of, of war refugees. And, I, and I, I think from a humanitarian perspective, we're all extremely sympathetic and supportive for the refugees that are in the country. I think there's about 50,000 of them at this stage. But the government are, are, are housing them in hotels. They're contracting with hotels right around the country. And that's where the Ukrainians are going. And that has an unintended uh, implication on the tourism economy, doesn't it? It has, and that is very much a two-edged sword, okay? Because I would be hugely, hugely sympathetic to Ukraine. Um, and I, I like it with um, eight, seven months ago, we had three um, Russian warships off the Kerry coast testing um, rockets. They could have tested anywhere they wanted in the middle of the Atlantic from Iceland down right down to the Falklands. But they chose off the Irish coast for whatever reason they did, okay? If those rockets had been pointed towards Ireland instead of out to the Atlantic, you and me and everyone we know would be in Ukraine tonight looking for rooms. So I would give any room I had to a Ukrainian free of charge. It wouldn't bother me in the slightest. But when you give over hotels to refugees, regardless of, of, of uh, this is the other side of the story of the sword, you dislodge tourism business. And mm. along the West Coast in particular, there is a number of areas that only survive on tourism. Yeah. And they survive on tourism from the person coming from Dublin to stay in the hotel to go out to buy petrol and buy two bars of chocolate for kids in the back of the car. And that is turnover and profit for that particular filling station. They stop and they have a cup of coffee and an ice cream at lunch or a sandwich, whatever the case it is. That's all local money that's staying locally. When you, when you, you, you give over large bulks and in certain towns all their accommodation to um, refugees regardless of uh, um, where they're coming from leave that aside for a moment the knock-on effect locally is enormous because yeah. all those little um, satellite businesses that base themselves on the increased footfall during the summer are deprived of business and that yeah. has a massive effect long term yeah if I was in Ukraine tonight, would I be thrilled that X hotel in Y town was giving me a room? I would, of course, because I'd be homeless and I'd have two kids and a wife with me and we'd all be in the same boat. So is it a short term pain for a long term gain to keep it, to keep Europe and the world united in peace? So be it if it is. Um, but I, I feel very, very sorry for the Ukrainians and I feel extremely sorry for the local businesses that are in the areas where large trunks of accommodation have been given to non-revenue generation business locally. Yeah, and yeah, and I think your 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 point about it being 
short term versus medium term versus long term is important because if this spills into spring, summer next year, then all those regional towns that you're talking about along the wide Atlantic way yes. that don't have any tourism accommodation stock won't get the tourists yes. and there will be knock on economic consequences. So yes. maybe yes. maybe a more creative approach to housing Ukrainian refugees or asylum seekers, you know, outside of just hotels is the answer. Yeah, and that's that's a very hard nut to crack, and um, because you're into huge big um, units for accommodation in areas like we have one family working with us. We have uh, two daughters and their mother and father work for us from Ukraine and the three different places. They're not all working together. They would buy they would buy a house. They had their own pub. They had their own shop. They were just like me. They had their own businesses at home. Next minute, bang, they're out, and they walked. I think they walked two hundred miles to get to the border, to mm. get a safe border crossing and to get out. They got, they got into the European system. They were sent to Ireland. They were sent to Kerry. And then we, we they came looking for work and we gave them work. And I'd be thrilled to give them work. Um, and they are superb. But they, they would they would rent a house. They'd buy a house if, there were, if that was available. But yeah. of course, we all know the issue with, with, with housing. Although that's a whole other debate because half Ken Mayer had 47 families living in it at one stage, it has three families now. So those other 44 accommodation bases over shops are all lying empty. So I sometimes yeah. wonder have, have we got a building problem or do we have an occupation problem? Um, yeah. Because occupancy in towns is on, it, it hugely depleted over what it was, but that's a whole different non tourism related argument. But yeah. it, is, it, is, it is very, very difficult to know how to handle it. it um, these are refugees from an invasion, they're not refugees from a civil war. Um, yeah. And there's, there's a, these have been displaced like that from a very um, economically strong first world nation. Yeah. And they're coming from a different base. And sometimes I think when, when and I would be guilty of this as well, we tend to have a, offer them jobs way below their capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we have to come to learn as well that if they are here to stay for a medium term, and I hope they're not here to stay for a long term from their own point of view, and um, if they're here for a medium or short or medium term point of view, I think we have to learn that maybe we can harness. Um, experience from them um, and gain from their skills that they have and their knowledge that they have in whatever walk of life they have, as opposed to offering them jobs just for the sake of offering them yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on a completely different matter, we are kind of a more mundane matter. We have the budget next week. Um, Pascal Donahue and Michael McGrath are going to stand up and give their budget. And, you know, it was COVID, it was Brexit a few years ago, then COVID, and now suddenly we're in the middle of a, of, of, of a economic Armageddon, if you read some of the financial pages, from a tourism perspective, you know, things like VAT of 9%, things like maintaining investment in, in, in you know, the tourism product and tourism services are, are important. Any particular views uh, that you have in relation to what budget can do for tourism or what budget maybe should be doing just in terms of the national picture? Yeah, access for an island. Access is key. Yeah, um, I, will, I will manage my business to the best of our ability and to the best that the market can offer us and I'll tweak and I'll push and I'll pull to make it work. Um, VASH is fantastic at 9%, um, but I'm also conscious that we have been recipients in the tourism industry of wonderful supports in recent years. And um, that's not a bottomless pit. Um, running a government is just like running a business. You have money coming in and money going out and you have to balance the books in the middle. Um, and I think... And um, we have to be conscious of the fact that, yes, there's an energy and we're talking about getting energy um, credits, which is fantastic, but energy isn't going to become cheaper. It is, it is going to be increased cost. And I think we need to manage our businesses with the costs that, that they incur, as opposed to managing our businesses on the back of supports. Um, and yeah. because I don't think supports are, 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 are good long-term and um, solutions yeah. i think we need to be conscious of where we are and um, to me now and you mentioned it earlier on about COVID and the worries and that the biggest worry i had through all of COVID was Aer Lingus and um, yeah. our transatlantic i couldn't care what else happened but we had to keep planned once we went yeah. back in the air Aer Lingus had to go back to america and yeah. um, that is crucial and if if there's issues in the airline and in access and um, i i would i would um 
be much happier in giving money towards ensuring that those routes are kept open and supports are put in place and and if that keeps coming we will get the business on the ground and we look after it and that looks after our business yeah yeah but access for ireland is crucial yeah great well listen thank you so much john and um, i mean uh, you know as you mentioned brexit covid the ukraine war you know and, and you know the phrase this too shall pass and you know uh, you said at the start we, we've both been around the block a couple of times and you remember 9 11 and the ash cloud and foot and mouth and the financial when crash you, so when, when you go and you look at it every four years since i came into the business 35 years ago there's been a major international crisis yeah. of some description yeah so it's not all this it is downs and the other thing just just to be end on a positive note um, Good the, bank, the banks haven't given foolish money since 2008 mm. so while we're facing a a, a major um, um, international um, unknown coming down the road individuals aren't exposed financially to the extent that we would have been um, um, back in 2008 so yeah. It, it, it may not be as big a bang as 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 the pages are are, are saying in, in the newspapers. It may be a softening, a realization, a step back, and analyze where we are, um, rather than a big bang. Um, yeah. I, I think I think it'll be softer than that. I think people have become very savvy with their personal money. Um, I don't think they're overexposed because the governments or the banks have been very prudent in recent years. Yeah. So, um, all things told, um. There's clouds on the horizon. There's always clouds on the horizon. I live in Kerry. Okay, we know about clouds on the horizon. Well, you, you have a lovely blue sky behind you, but I think that's artificial, is it? Excuse me, it is not. If you looked out that window, you'd see a beautiful, <laughs> nicer sky. But anyway, that's a different story. It's no beautiful day here. Today. We've had a smashing summer weather-wise. Really, yeah. really great. Yeah. So the stories going overseas when they went back home after this year is great country, not cheap, but not expensive from a value point of view. And you should visit. That's what I hear anyway. So please, God, it's true. Great. Well, listen, John, thank you so much for your time and your, your advice and your wisdom. And best of luck with business. And you too. And thanks indeed now. Thank you.